Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at Morphe's taking a look at a very early JP Sauer. Well, it's not a K98K, although it certainly does look like one, but the K98K didn't exist when this rifle was made. So, what we have here is, I think, a really interesting part of the story of German rearmament in the 19... well, the 1930s, really, um, but starting in the 1920s. So, how do we go from the Gewehr 98 to the Car 98K? The story begins when, in the aftermath of World War I, the Mauser factory sells a complete uh, production line for the Gewehr 98 to Czechoslovakia. The Czechs are, of course, a brand new country at this point. They are eager to set up some domestic arms production capability to equip their own army and, you know, to make some money selling guns to other people. The Mauser factory recognizes that there is limited possibility of making lots of money building arms in Germany for the coming duration under the Treaty of Versailles. And so they are quite happy to sell all this tooling down to Czechoslovakia, where it's set up in Brno. And the first thing that the Czechs do is they take this obnoxiously long Gewehr 98 and shorten it down to this length, 600 millimeter barrel or 23.6 inches. And they call this first the Model 23, and then they designate it the Model 24, and they start exporting a lot of them. And in fact, the Belgians in um, at FN are also selling quite a lot of 600 millimeter barrel Mauser pattern rifles. And the Mauser company looks at this and takes note, obviously, and they introduce their own in the same configuration. They call this the standard model. Uh, in addition to shortening the barrel, they also replace the Gewehr 98's roller coaster rear sight with a much more practical tangent rear sight. Not only is this, well, it has a couple improvements. Uh, it doesn't get blisteringly hot when you shoot the rifle a lot, which the roller coaster did. It is, has settings down to 100 meters instead of the 400 meter minimum sight uh, radius or sight setting of the Gewehr 98. And it has sight increments in 50 meter, or sight adjustments in 50 meter increments, which makes it much easier to target specific, relatively small things. This was at, at intermediate ranges. This was a complaint about the Gewehr 98 during World War I. So this becomes the Mauser standard model. They sell a bunch of them to China, they sell them to a bunch of countries in South America. They're doing some of this on the down low without attracting the attention of the Inter-Allied Military Control Commission, because they're really not supposed to be doing this at this point. But they do it anyway to help the economy, to help the Mauser company survive. A bunch of reasons. Now, we fast forward a few years to 1933. Adolf Hitler comes to power, and one of the first things that he plans to do is a significant program to rearm Germany. Mauser is, of course, very interested in this. Uh, at this point, 1933, Mauser makes basically one more little improvement to their standard model, and that is to bend the bolt handle down and cut out a little recess in the stock underneath the bolt handle. Uh, this becomes... well, they market this rifle. They still can't really publicly be making military arms, so this is the Gewehr for Deutsches Reichspost. It's for the post office, definitely. And only, certainly... well, not just only the post office, but it's only civilian agencies like the post office and the train... Uh, the railway, railway police and the customs office and the border patrol. And actually, it turns out you can make an awful lot of rifles and claim that they're definitely not for the army. Uh, in fact, Mauser was also selling these to the SA and the SS, uh, some of the armed elements of the Nazi party itself. And by the way, the army wasn't... the German army wasn't too thrilled about that. Uh, there were you know, on the order of 20 times as many guys registered in the SA as there were in the actual Reichswehr, the official German army, and the German military. Uh, administration wasn't too thrilled about this. So what they end up doing is they contract to purchase the entire output of the Mauser factory. And that very nicely settles this problem of how do we prevent uh, the SA from buying up its own arms. Well, if they can't buy anything because we bought all the guns first, that solves the problem without having to be uh, real confrontational about it. At any rate, um, Mauser develops this uh, rifle for the post office uh, in late 1933. Example, and, and they start making them. Um, 
They get out there, and in 1934 the Harris Waffenamt, which is the German weapons office, part of the army, announces that it will be adopting a new standardized rifle for the German military. They're finally going to abandon this long rifle short carbine thing. Um, they're already sort of doing this sneakily uh, through rifles like the, the post office rifles, which basically all went into the army eventually. Um, but they announce it formally, and at this point there are two companies that respond, again, formally to the request. One is Mauser, and one is J.P. Sauer. J.P. Sauer had manufactured Gewehr 98s during World War I, so they already had all the tooling. Uh, they knew how to make these guns. They were able to get examples of the post office Mauser rifles, so they didn't have to go to Mauser for any specific help. They basically said, oh, well, uh, that's clearly what the army is going to want. We will build a version of that, submit it to the trials. And they were so excited about it that actually both they and Mauser started full-scale production of these rifles before the German army actually picked one of them as a winner. So what we have here is one of the 1934 production J.P. Sauer rifles that was produced for what would become the K98K contract, but before the K98K was actually formally designated or adopted. And there's like one little detail that's different from this to a regular K98K. So when the German army announces in 1934 that it's going to be adopting a new rifle, it specifically includes a couple of features. It wants the short rifle pattern, uh, clearly based on the Mauser standard model, so a 600 millimeter barrel. It wants a rear sight that is adjustable from 100 out to 2,000 meters in 50 meter increments. Worth noting that the sight increments are also printed on the bottom of the sight, so that a soldier lying prone can flip the sight forward and be able to properly set it without having to make himself too big of a target by lifting his body up. And they also wanted a bolt hold open follower. Uh, there were problems in World War I of soldiers losing track of how much ammunition they had, emptying the magazine, and then closing the bolt on an empty magazine, thinking that they had another round. So a flat surface on the follower prevents you from closing the bolt if there is not the cartridge in the magazine. And so J.P. Sauer jumped at the opportunity to produce a rifle to these specifications, and their first production guns came out in 1934, and they have a number of distinct features. First off, there's nothing on the top of the receiver. Instead, all the markings are on the side here. We have pretty much the standard pattern that would be continued into wartime production of three, uh, three incremental proof marks. And then the manufacturer's code is here on the side. The, when, when Sauer basically signed up for military contracts, they were given the factory code of S147. So that's marked there. And then K is the date code for 1934. The date code letters didn't go in order, um, and they only used them for a couple of years. The 1935 code letter was G, so S134K is the 1934 production. All right. We have serial numbers here on the receiver and the barrel. This is 7656. This is actually the highest known uh, example of one of these 1934 production Sauer rifles. And this is an all-matching gun. So we got the matching number on the nose cap, the barrel band, the bolt, the trigger guard, the magazine floor plate, the stock, and so on and so forth. We also have a whole bunch of Harris Waffenamt Eagle uh, inspection marks there, the WAA marks and a couple on the side of the stock here as well. This Eagle H is for here, uh, for the army. Although it is interesting to note that this is actually also stamped RFV 1780 on the butt plate, as well as the serial number down there. Uh, RFV is the German Finance Ministry, another one of those civilian organizations that got itself some issued rifles as a way to get guns produced and into circulation. Uh, under the oversight of the Allied forces. Now the one place where J.P. Sauer's rifle really actually differs from the official K98K that would be adopted is in the retention of the barrel bands. So what Sauer did is they put a barrel band spring here on the right for the front band, 
and they put another spring here on the left for the rear band. Mauser's pre-K98K rifles had a spring for the rear, but they just had a little, basically a pin, holding the front band in place, and that would occasionally uh, pop loose. What would be adopted for official production is this system, where a single spring on the right holds both the front and rear bands. That's essentially it. That's the only difference between Sauer's prototype and the eventual production K98Ks. That slight bit of non-standardization uh, didn't prevent these from seeing military service. Uh, all of the Sauer production pre-K98K rifles did, in fact, go into army service. J.P. Sauer continued to manufacture these pre-K98K rifles into the early part of 1935. It would be in June of 35 when the German army officially announced its new Carabiner 98K pattern and standardized the design, mainly. Well, compared to this, the change in, in barrel band retention. And at that point, Sauer would convert its production over to the official K98K pattern, and we see a transition of the markings to those that are recognized from really the standard regular bulk production. Um, they made something on the order of another 1600, maybe 1700 of these pattern rifles in early 1935 before that transition. So, um, as not just one of the very scarce early Sour, 1934 Sauer rifles, but an all matching example, one that, like, this rifle had to go through all of World War II without being destroyed, uh, you know, significantly overhauled, anything like that. It's really quite remarkable that a rifle like this survives, and it's a really cool piece for the Mauser or the K98K collector. So very cool to get a chance to take a look at this. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, despite my very long uh, rambling about the uh, rearmament process. Thanks for watching.